will be honoured. Yeah. We pray for him in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, God. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see you. I'm going to speak from down the floor, if I may. So I'm going to grab one of these stands. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, great to be with you this morning. Thank you for your welcome. I was here on Palm Sunday, I think, last year, just before Easter, sharing. And um, it's great to come to a church and share. It's even greater to come to a, share and be, a church to share and be invited back to share again another time. So that's a real blessing. So thank you for having me again. I'm going to speak from your series on 1 John. That's right, isn't it? You're going through 1 John? I got, I got the right memo? Good. Okay. Excellent. Good. So I'm going to share from 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And I've entitled it The One in Us, because it's all about the Holy Spirit. And uh, so we're going to explore a little bit of that today. But before I do that, I wanted to start with a very well-known passage of Scripture that was also written by John, but not in 1 John, in the Gospel of John. It's a passage that we often read at Christmas, and so you may well know it very well. But just like Gordon was encouraging us earlier, sometimes there's familiarity in some of the things we read or sing. And so sometimes it's really good just to listen in to the words and really consider what they're saying. And I hope, as I read from John chapter 1, John's Gospel, then I'm hoping that this will make a little bit more sense as we dive into 1 John in a few moments' time. Can I encourage you, if you're, if you're happy to, just to close your eyes where you're at, uh, just to help us really focus in on these words. So John chapter 1 from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. What incredible words that John opens his gospel with. So this is John, one of Jesus' closest disciples, the one John actually says in his gospels a few times, that he's the one that Jesus dearly loved. He was so close to Jesus. He's also, as we've said, the author of 1 John, the book we're looking at. And so today I've got the privilege of speaking from 1 John chapter 4. If you want to follow it, I'm going to have it up on the screen behind us. You can obviously follow it in your Bible if you prefer to do that as well. But just before I read from 1 John chapter 4, I just think it's really important when you look at a specific passage of Scripture, just to consider what, become, what comes before and what goes after as well. Because when the Bible authors were writing the Bible, they didn't write it with the chapters and the verses we have now. So a letter like 1 John would just be a letter that was written continuously. The verses and the chapters were added later on. And so you can read to the end of chapter 3 and then just straight into chapter 4. We don't have any 
headings that in the original letter, they, like chapters and verses, were, were added later. So sometimes, it's, well, often, always, it's really useful to see what happens before. And I know that you were looking at the end of 1 John chapter 3 last week. And what an amazing passage of scripture, all about love. And really, this letter of 1 John, huge theme in that letter is love. And so before our passage in 1 John 4, and after our passage, as we continue in chapter 4, which I presume you'll pick up next week, picking up the theme of love again. So love just goes right throughout this book of 1 John. But I love the way that chapter 3 ends. There's three things, just as I was considering it in preparing for today, three things that I picked up at the end of chapter 3. The first one is that we know we belong to God. We know we are God's if we believe in Jesus. Amen? Amen? That's one way we know we belong to God, because we believe in Jesus. Secondly, we know that we are God's. We know that we belong to him if we love one another. That was the message last week. It continues throughout the book. We know we're God's if we love one another. And finally, we know that we're God's if we keep his commands. John, again, in his gospel, chapter 14, verse 15, said, quoting Jesus, saying, If you love me, keep my commands. If we love Jesus, if we belong to God, then we want to obey him. We want to keep his commands. So I want you to bear this in mind as we come into chapter 4, that we know we belong to God. Belong to God. If we believe in Jesus, we love one another, and we keep his commands. And then finally, the last verse in chapter 3, remember it runs straight on into chapter 4, but the last verse in chapter 3 says this, and this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. And then we read this, 1 John chapter 4 from verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. But we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So it might take a little bit of unpacking to try and see what God is really wanting to say to us today through this. But we're going to pick out a few things and see where we get to. So this passage, 1 John 4, 1 to 6, it's all about recognising the difference between the Spirit, with a capital S, the Spirit of God, and spirits with a small s, which is anything else and falls so much lower and falls so short of the Spirit of God with a capital S. In, in uh, verse 4 of this passage, John says, The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Praise God that the Holy Spirit in us is greater than any other spirit at work in this world. Amen? Amen? Let me just repeat that. I think that's worth repeating. Praise God that the Holy Spirit in us is greater than any other spirit that's at work in this world. We are overcomers when we have the Spirit of God at work in us. 
Paul puts it this way, another New Testament writer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3, he says, Therefore I want you to know that no one who's speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Because you see, the Holy Spirit will always point us to and help us to glorify Jesus. If we've got the Spirit at work in us, we can declare his praises. And there's no way we would say anything like Jesus be cursed if we have the Holy Spirit in us. We just wouldn't do it. The Holy Spirit will not lead us that way. He will only ever lead us to glorify Jesus. So in about 1999, I think it was, I had the privilege of going to South Africa. And I was part of a youth group in Southampton at the time, really thriving church youth group. And we had the privilege of sending out some teams over a few years to different places. And we went to South Africa. And we had a band as part of the team, just uh, musicians from the, from, from the church, from the youth. And I had the privilege of leading that, playing guitar, singing. We had a bass guitarist. We had a, a drummer, a keyboard player and uh, other members of the team as well. And we'd go out and just try and bless other youth groups and churches and see what God wanted to do. And so we were doing a bit of that, running some services. And one day, we were told by our hosts that we were going to go to a prison. And so we were like, okay, this wasn't on the itinerary. What's, what's this going to be like? And so we had no idea. We were led into this prison. They took our watches and cameras and things like that off us. Uh, but we had our musical instruments ready to do a bit of worship. And we went through a door. And I was not prepared for it at all. But we went through a door. And suddenly we were in this huge courtyard with 1,200 male prisoners. And it was... took me back a little bit. And I think it took us all back a little bit. We just weren't expecting just the, the vastness of this scene. And so we were there with our instruments and we thought, well, let's do what we do. We're going to lead some worship. And so we started setting up and we had some speakers with us and we realized that we didn't have any power, <clears throat> no plug sockets. And so we, uh, we asked, there was one guard there that we could see and we asked the guard, is it possible just to have some power just to plug our speakers into? And so a four-way appeared through a nearby window and we plugged in and we were ready to start and... I just thought, hang on a minute, that's the only guard I've seen. <laughs> For 1,200 prisoners, and this guard was stood there with a piece of hose pipe about that long, and that was it. And I thought for a moment, if this goes wrong, <laughs> this is going to go really wrong. But anyway, we're here, and we're going to lead worship, so let's go for it. And so we started playing our very white, western worship songs, Matt Redman, Delirious, Tim Hughes, all those kind of songs, if you're... Like me, old enough to remember, remember those kind of songs. We still sing some of them today, don't we, which are great. But that was, that was what we did. And so we, was, we were singing those songs. And we realized, what are we, what are we doing? We're here singing the songs that we know. These guys clearly didn't know the song. We had a number gathering around us listening. But they didn't know the songs. The, the style of music, we were missing it big time. And so we played a song, we were on to the second one, and I was starting to think, do we just try and push through with this? Or do we just need to do something completely different? But we're playing this second song, all these men just standing there looking at us, just like, this is not connecting on any front. And as we're doing this, one of the, one of the guys, one of the prisoners came and uh, pushed through the crowd and came to the front and just started dancing in front of us in a really spiritually concerning and pretty crude way. And that made me think even more, like, what are we, what are we doing? How are we going to deal with this? And um, there's a guy called John who was part of our team playing bass on my right. And he knew what to do. He carried some authority in God. He really did. And he put his bass guitar down and he walked forward and he just put his hand out towards this man and said, in the name of Jesus, stop. And he did. He stopped dancing. And I didn't even see him do it, but he disappeared back into the crowd. And we didn't see him again. Because you know what? The one who's in us is greater than the one who's in the world. And so we finished that song, and nothing had shifted 
other than that spiritually, and it still wasn't working well at all. And so we decided we're going to stop this now. This is not connecting at all. And so we put our instruments down and we thought, well, what are we going to do? Because we've got this crowd around us now and we're expected to come and minister to these men. And so we decided what's left for us to do, the only thing we can do is pray. And so we just said, look, we're going to stop singing these songs now. But if anyone would like prayer, then we'd love to pray for you. And our one guard with his piece of hose pipe was looking a little bit nervous. <laughs> but a queue formed straight away. And we, one by one, members of our team, just went and started praying for these men who just wanted something of God. And you could see that God was moving on them. The guard was getting a little bit twitchy at one point because he's like, what are you doing? You're putting a hand on their shoulder. What's going on? But God was moving clearly in these people's lives. And it was a joy to see. And we had some amazing conversations, just as these men, desperate to hear something about God, because they clearly were, could see God moving in their lives. Greater is he who's in us than he who is in the world. God just wanted to, the one in us, the Holy Spirit living in us, just wanted to get out and touch people's lives. And it was a joy to see it. So how do we know that the Holy Spirit is in someone and whether a spirit is from God? This is what this passage is talking about a bit here as well. How do we know that? Well, we're given the answer also in our passage. It says they acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God. They acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God. Maybe now we see why John opened his gospel all about Jesus coming in the flesh. That's how we know that the Spirit with a capital S is in someone, the Spirit of God, because it's all pointing to Jesus. It's all about Jesus, like Paul picks up as well in that passage we looked at in 1 Corinthians 12. And you know, we see so many spirits with a small s, so many spirits at work that don't acknowledge that Jesus has come in the flesh. Maybe you've heard things, I know like I have, maybe you've heard things like, well, Jesus was a good man. Yeah, clearly there's enough evidence he walked on the earth. He was a good man, but nothing more. Or you might hear that Jesus was a prophet, not the Son of God. How can that be true? How can the Son of God come down? How... But you know that the Spirit of God is in someone when they acknowledge that Jesus Christ, Son of God, has come in the flesh. And not just come, but he died upon a cross for us, rose again three days later, and is now exalted, as we've been singing this morning, given all power and authority, sat at the right hand of the Father. And I was thinking about this acknowledging that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, or confessing that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Because sometimes I think we can fall for a little trap, that we think the Christian life is just about acknowledging as if, just say, oh yeah, I think Jesus is out there. I'm going to acknowledge Jesus, yeah. Every so often, oh yeah, Jesus, you're around, aren't you? Thank you for that. This is way more than just a verbal thing of acknowledging Jesus. To acknowledge him, I believe John is talking about making him the Lord of our lives. Not just some sort of verbal acknowledgement that he's out there. Submitting to him, giving him everything. When Jesus announced that the kingdom of God was coming, you can read about it in Mark 1, chapter, uh, verse 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus announced that the kingdom of God was coming, breaking in, and he called his followers, he called the people to repent and to believe. And I think we can so easily misunderstand this. Sometimes we can think repenting and believing means saying sorry and having this kind of acknowledgement, like I've said, that Jesus is kind of out there. But you know what? I think it's so much more than that. Repenting doesn't mean just saying sorry. Repenting means, repenting means to, to change your mind, to change direction. That's what repenting really means. So much more than just saying sorry. If I went into a shop and I stole something, 
And I walked out with it, and then the member of staff ran down the road and stopped me and said, you can't take that, you haven't paid for it, give it back. And I was like, oh, okay, sorry, and give, give it back to him. And then, I, then he, goes and I go, he goes back to his shop, and I go, go on my way. And then the next day, I come into the shop, and I steal something again. And I walk out with it, and the member of staff comes and chases me down the road again and says, what are you doing? Stop stealing from, oh, sorry, and give it back. He or she are going to say, well, you're not sorry, are you? Because you did it yesterday and you've come back and you've done it again today. So you're clearly not sorry. Don't say sorry if you're not sorry. Because, you see, repenting is not just about saying sorry. Repenting is about changing your behavior. Repenting is about changing your mind, changing the direction of your life, doing things differently. Repenting would mean I'm not going to go back and steal anymore. (laughs) That's what repenting is. And then believing, like I say, sometimes we can think, well, believing is just about, yeah, Jesus, you're out there somewhere, I believe in you. But actually, I think biblical belief, like John and others would talk about, is about actually making Jesus king of our lives. Making him number one. Giving him everything. I could say, look, I believe in giving to charity, for example, But if I never gave to charity, you'd say, well, you don't really believe in giving to charity. You just believe it's kind of like a decent thing to do. But unless you actually go ahead and give to charity, that's evidence of your belief. And so let's be those who have evidence of our belief in Jesus. Not just uh, even a daily or weekly or a monthly acknowledgement that, yeah, Jesus, you're out there. But actually saying, I believe in you. I'm choosing to follow you. I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to make you king of my life, lord of my life. Make you number one in everything. So repenting, changing your mind, changing direction, belief. It's got to have action to it. It's got to have substance to it. So just as I come in to finish, let me go back to where we started and suggest that John wants us to know that spirit-filled believers of Jesus, followers of Jesus, who have truly made him Lord of their lives, believe in Jesus, and not just an abstract acknowledgement. I don't think when John says acknowledge that Jesus has come in the flesh, he means just a kind of, yeah. But like I've said, believe in Jesus. Give him everything. That we love one another. Those inside, those outside of the church, those who are difficult to love, that's the real test of love. And then finally, we keep God's commands. We obey him. Because he's king, because we truly believe in him, we want to obey what he's saying to us. Things we read in the scripture, things we feel like God is saying to us to do by his Holy Spirit, will we obey him? as we follow him. So I just want to pause. Would it be right if I pray? Jenny, would that be okay? Thank you. Oh, Rachel, sorry. Let me just encourage you to close your eyes if you're happy to. I just simply want to reflect on those three points that are up on the screen. And just ask you, which one of those have resonated with you this morning? Maybe they all have. Maybe there's one of them has. Maybe two of them have. Whatever it is. I just want to ask you, do you truly want to make Jesus Lord of your life this morning? Many of you have, I'm sure. Times like this are a really good opportunity just to revisit that and say, am I actually making Jesus Lord of my life? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never acknowledged Jesus in any way. Maybe for you, you feel like this morning, actually, I do want to make Jesus Lord of my life for the very first time. Maybe you've been in this church for years, decades, Maybe you follow Jesus all your life and you're thinking, I wonder if I've just been acknowledging him 
in the sense that he's out there coming along to church faithfully, but actually I need to give him everything. So maybe you want to respond to that and say, yes, I truly want to make Jesus Lord of my life. Maybe as you go through this series on 1 John, you're being challenged about loving one another. How do we really love one another in this church? How do we really love those who are outside of the church? How do we really love those who we find difficult to really love? Maybe that's a challenge for you this morning. Or maybe you sense that actually I haven't quite made Jesus Lord of everything because he's asking me to do something and I'm holding back. Or I'm reading in the scriptures things that Jesus is asking me to do and I'm just not really doing it. There's no condemnation here at all. It's just an opportunity to come before Jesus this morning and say, be Lord of everything. Be Lord of my life. So I'm just going to pray. If you want to respond to any of those, please feel free to. If you want to stand up as a bit of a kind of physical response to that, you're very free to. If you're happy to sit and just pray and listen and see what God would say, then that's fine as well. Respond how you'd like to. But Lord Jesus, we truly want to make you Lord of everything. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Anything I'm holding back, I want you to be Lord of it all. Come before you this morning and give you my life afresh today. Use it as you will. Lord, give me a love for those around me. Give me a love for others in this church. Give me a love for those who haven't encountered you yet. Give me a love for those I struggle to love. We want to love like you did, Jesus. Thank you that your love is for everyone and we want to be those who love everyone that you've placed around us. Help us, Lord, we pray. And Lord, all that you command us to do in your word, all that you're speaking to us about now, we want to obey you, Jesus. We want to be those who hear your words and put them into practice, as you said so many times. Lord Jesus, help us to be those who hear and respond. Save us from just saying sorry and having a belief that you're out there somewhere. Help us to truly repent day by day, believe in you, respond in action to the things that we sense that you're asking us to do. Thank you, Jesus.